Uh, good evening, everyone. Today is Thursday, August 13th, and this is the organizational meeting of the school committee. This is a short meeting. We'll conduct the business of organizing the committee and adjourn until 630 when we will proceed with the first meeting of this term. Uh, to start, I want to say that I'm grateful for the support of the town, the re-election of Dr. Seuss, Mr. Hainer, and myself. As a community, we face many challenges, including a rapidly expanding school enrollment and the challenge of meeting the growing capital and operating costs associated with our student population. Arlington is not an apathetic town. Tremendous, this really was a tremendous vote of confidence for the three of us, the entire committee, to have run uncontested people I think genuinely appreciate the work that we're doing. I'm proud to serve with such good friends and capable colleagues. I'm thankful for the support and partnership with town side officials, and it's gratifying to see people elected to town meeting in competitive precincts by pledging support for the schools. We face many challenges, but I know I'm surrounded by great people who are up to the task. We begin by electing our next chair, Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, I'd like to nominate Jeff Thielman as chair. Any uh, second? Second. Uh, moved and seconded. All in favor of electing Mr. Thielman as chair, say aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. Uh, Mr. Thielman. I nominate Dr. Allison Ampey as vice chair. Second? Second. Second. Uh, moved and seconded. Um, all in favor of electing Dr. Allison Ampey vice chair, say aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Dr. Allison Ampey. Oh, I move. I nominate Mr. Hainer as uh, secretary. Second? A second. Okay. Uh, moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That is unanimous. I'm looking for a motion to approve the subcommittee and liaison assignments as presented. Moved by Mr. Thielman, okay. second by Dr. Allison Ampey. Uh, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, the motion is approved. I'm looking for a motion to authorize the chair and the chair of the warrant committee to sign the payroll warrant. Motion by Dr. Allison Ampey, second by Mr. Cardin. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is approved. Policy BDA directs the newly elected chair to read aloud the standards and norms of the Arlington School Committee, and he will invite each member of the Arlington School Committee to publicly sign the document. Mr. Chairman. We, the Arlington School Committee, acknowledge that a school committee meeting is a meeting of school committee members that is held in public and not a public meeting, and that we will make every effort to ensure that meetings are effective and efficient. To that end, we acknowledge the importance of subcommittees, and we and the superintendent agree to utilize them to focus on specific topics in depth and to prepare for presentation, deliberation, and possible action by the school committee. We, the Arlington School Committee, set forth these standards and norms that we will all commit to abide by as individuals and as a committee represent the needs and interests of all students in the district, exercise leadership and vision, planning, policy making, evaluation, and advocacy on behalf of the students in district, not in managing the day-to-day -day operations of the district. Conduct our business through a set agenda. Emerging items will be addressed in subsequent meetings through agenda items. Provide full disclosure. Each member will provide input, encouragement, express concerns and positions rather than withhold information from other members. When a committee member feels that there has not been full disclosure, an objective process for revisiting the issue will be used. Maintain an open environment where each member is empowered to freely express opinions, concerns and ideas. Committee members will work together to clarify and restate discussions in order to strive for full understanding. Keep an open mind and accept that they can change their opinions by recognizing that they are not locked into their initial stated positions. Make decisions on information and not on personalities. Committee members will act with the best information available at the time considering data, the superintendent's recommendations, proposals, and suggestions. Committee members will strive to make the best decision at the time. Debate the issues, not one another. The committee will engage in critical thinking, expecting all committee members to freely offer differing points of view as part of the discussion prior to making a board decision not take unilateral action. A committee member's authority is derived only through a majority decision of the committee acting as a whole during an open public meeting. Attend public meetings while prepared to discuss issues on the agenda and will be prepared to take decisions striving for efficient decision making. Strive to have no surprises for the committee or superintendent. All members will receive the same information on all topics in a timely manner. 
Strive to reach decisions by consensus, discuss with respect, disagree without acrimony. When a consensus is not possible, all members will publicly abide by the majority decision, understand and respect the chain of command as it concerns roles and responsibilities and direct others to do the same, review and revise our standards and norms as needed as part of the committee's self-evaluation. This was adopted by the school committee on March 22nd, 2012. And signatures, please. All right, Mr. Schlickman, I will sign. All right. Len, do you want to sign for dentist? <laughs> <laughs> No proxies. Ah. Uh, with the standards and norms for the Arlington School Committee signed by all members present, the uh, work of this organizational meeting is concluded. Uh, motion to adjourn by Mr. Hainer, second, second by Dr. Allison Ampey. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? We are adjourned. Congratulations to our new officers. Okay. Okay, welcome to the school committee meeting of uh, April 13th, 2017. We're going to begin with a moment of silence for uh, two people. First, we're going to uh, remember Greg Wright. Greg uh, was a custodian at the Bishop School for 20 years. Uh, Bishop used the Bishop, uh, custodian of the Arlington Public Schools for 20 years um, and uh, most recently served at the Bishop School, and uh, he passed away about a week ago. Uh, and that was shocking to uh, the faculty, staff, and students at that school. And we also want to take a moment of silence for State Senator Ken Donnelly, uh, who died uh, uh, more than a week ago. Ken was a very good friend of the Arlington Public Schools and our students and our teachers and someone uh, who was devoted to the town and the entire district that he represented. So let's take a moment of silence for both of those men. Thank you very much. <clears throat> May I add a couple of words? Yeah, let's go ahead, Kathy. Um, I just want to add a couple of words to that. Um, I have to say that Greg White was just a wonderful human being, um, quite beloved at Bishop School. And um, in fact, what was particularly shocking is that that Sunday evening, he had been working with the principal and parents and staff um, and, and taking down the, the play um, equipment and uh, and um, props and then passed away soon later that evening Ken Donnelly I you were absolutely correct is a huge friend to the Arlington Public Schools in so many ways in probably ways people don't even know the last time I saw Senator Donnelly was at the State House when he took time out of his very busy day to come and be part of the commendation of Brackett School all, all of the schools that had, had received that um, uh, honor this year met at the State House, um, and both um, Senator Donnelly and Sean Garbley attended, as well as, as, well as um, our, our Representative Rogers. Also, when we, this, earlier this fall, we had a, uh, an event in which Odyssey Middle School was celebrating diversity, and, and the, the pictures are still somewhat still on the wall, in which we had um, pictures of our students um, plastered over walls on both sides of the school. And it was, it was uh, Senator Donnelly came and just sort of slipped in to be part of that um, event, and it just meant so much to everyone that he would come to these very special times uh, for students and staff in our schools and he will be um, long remembered um, very fondly and with much gratitude for his work. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to recognize Lucy Bogus, uh, who was a sophomore, member of the student council. She's involved in a number of uh, activities at the high school and she's the vice president of the sophomore class. So welcome, you're welcome to participate 
and uh, I may call on you, so just get ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay, public participation. Any public participation? Anyone want to say anything? Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> so our first, uh, first person on the agenda tonight is Paul McKnight, uh, and Paul is going to talk to us about a, soft, about a survey of uh, sophomores, and uh, we're eager, eager to hear that. Come on up. Thank you. Um, and thank you to uh, Dr. Bodhi for giving me the time to uh, uh, ad address you. Um, I asked if uh, I asked for a few minutes just to fill you in on the uh, on the uh, administration of the OECD test for schools, which happened in March. Um, and I, I am so um, I have uh, spoken to the school committee. I believe it was last year in the context of being an English a member of the English department. This year, I am doing my uh, administrative internship um, at at the high school. And uh, one of those uh, projects, one of those roles, was administering for the first time in our district um, this uh, test that is modeled on um, PISA, which is the International uh, Student Assessment. Um, and uh, which, and again, which we are essentially did for the first time. So this is a, essentially an adaptation of a, a presentation that I uh, created and gave to uh, some, a, few, a handful of interested parents um, who were the parents of the students who were selected were invited. Um, so the, again, the quick, the very the quick rundown of this is it is a test that's modeled on um, the PISA, I'll, which I'll speak about briefly. Um, it did involve a random sampling of uh, sophomores. Um, it ended up being uh, 61 uh, sophomores who ended up uh, taking the, t the test. It is a two-hour uh, test, um, the academic portion of it, uh, in three subject areas, reading, math, and science. Um, because it was an online test, the, the administration of this uh, was done over in f four separate sessions in the same uh, computer lab. It was briefly interrupted by a, a snowstorm, the March 14th storm, mm. um, and uh, again, the, the re and the results of this test uh, will be available to us, and the, the report will be available to us in, in September. Um, but just to get into a little bit more detail about those, um, this so this initiative uh, begins with. Uh, an organization called America Achieves. Um, they have several um, uh, educational reform, school improvement uh, divisions and programs. One of those is uh, something called the Global Learning Network, which we are, I believe, now a part of uh, because of this participation. And the focus of the focus of that uh, of that America Achieves Global Learning Network is to um, invite and encourage American schools to participate in this assessment as a way of learning about their students and as a way about making in international comparisons um, and national comparisons, um, and then as a way of driving perhaps some, some school reform and reflection. Um, we signed on as part of an initiative with uh, the Commissioner of Education and the Department of Education, uh, Elementary and Secondary Education, um, that was in, invited the first, I believe it was the first 30 districts who agreed to uh, participate in this, um, essentially were, got, got to administer the test for free. Um, so that was part of our, our, our contract. Um, and that decision based on, and this is what I've been told by Dr. Bodhi and uh, Principal Janger, is that it was, you know, we were interested both in, in terms of the data we could get about this, as well as the access to the learning network and the resources, the professional development resources and, insti and organizations, institutions that come along with that. Um, but that participation required the, again, testing um, a sample of uh, 85 uh, 15 year olds uh, as I said it was 61 so the actual threshold is 80% of the of the target number that that you give us that they that they g give us um, so I, I included a link but um, for your information for your interest if you're uh, on the piece it is very it is very uh, rudimentary explanation of, of this uh, assessment that is conducted. Um, what I learned about it is conducted every three years um, by the organization, the countries that are involved in the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, um, rotating through math, science, and reading. Um, 
And the, uh, I also included a link to a document that the testing um, organization shared with us that has um, sample questions in each of the subject areas, um, which are, are very interesting to look at because in some ways they're very different from the, the some of the standardized testing that our, that our students uh, take via MCAS. The, the main difference between the OECD test for schools and the PISA is the PISA really only pr uh, provides uh, uh, aggregated international data. So if a, sc a school in Finland whose students sit this, uh, this exam, they don't learn anything about their individual school. It only provides a national level of performance. Um, so the OECD uh, test for schools is designed um, uh, to, to provide uh, schools with, with information about their own district, their own students' performance. Um, however, there, there are not, as I'll point out later, um, students do not get individual score reports. Um, but uh, it, the, another difference, again, is, is that it, it can be administered at any time. Um, so we, we could administer this test annually, um, every two years, every three years, never again. Um, as, as, as it's up to us. Whereas the PISA administration, again, is on a fixed uh, three-year schedule. Uh, so I, did, I just included on the slide in the presentation to students and parents uh, uh, just some of what, what one of the sample questions uh, looks like. The, the, it, what one thing I noticed is it's very kind of uh, in, interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary um, and it's very much about at applying knowledge. This, and uh, here's a science question that's very much also about reading, um, and there's a, a graph that goes along with this, and the, the, you know, the questions ask for interpretation and understanding of that graph, as well as questions that are about what, would ha what might happen again um, if, you know, uh, uh, you know, again, if like a predator, uh, if some element of this, uh, this chain was disrupted, et cetera, et cetera. So it really asks for a lot of uh, uh, speculation and application and theorizing as well. Um, how does, uh, uh, this differs from some of the other assessments that w our students have taken in that, again, it does require a little bit more uh, problem solving, so it may not look like the, the uh, subject matter knowledge that they get in class, but um, either combining that with other subject matters. Um, so again, some of the, some of the, re the reading components can involve uh, science and math topics. Um, and also, the, the, the two-hour cognitive exam is followed by a 10-minute uh, a uh, questionnaire about students' effort, which is, I think is actually going to be very important because since students don't have an in individual in incentive to perform, um, the one thing they, they, the, the test then asks is, how hard did you try? And would you have tried harder if it counted? Uh, those kinds of questions, and I believe that that information is uh, becomes kind of correlated with uh, the, the data. Uh, it also includes an extensive uh, 30 to 35 minute questionnaire that asks uh, students about uh, demographics, um, you know, their, their backgrounds, home life, um, things that they see in their reading habits, things that they see going on in their school, school climate, and instructional practices. Um, and again, that information becomes uh, that be becomes part of the, 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 the data that is reported. Um, and as I mentioned, students do not receive an individual score, nor do we receive indi individual scores for them. So again, a quick breakdown of, of, of what it looks like. It took about, uh, with breaks, about th three and a half hours to administer. Um, the selection of the students is, is random. It begins with, um, uh, that we, we narrowed it down to 15-year-old uh, sophomores. Um, we, we made a, a few exclusions on the basis of students that we felt that um, either for social, emotional, or cognitive reasons would not be able to complete the test. It was not, a, a, students were not screened out on the basis of their academic achievement or ability or, or even uh, special education status. Um, it was really sort of more extreme, extreme cases. Um, 
that roster was submitted to the Northwest Edu uh, Evaluation Association, who, who uh, does the technical aspect of the exam. Um, and then they spit back to us a, a list of, uh, of 85 students and essentially say, test these, test these students. Um, that list was updated. The, this was handled through a, uh, on their recommendation, a passive uh, permission uh, option. In other words, those 85 students were then, I, I sent them letters, I sent their parents letters um, notifying them they had been selected with a, and the parents received permission slips and it was, if they uh, wanted to uh, have their students excluded from the test, then they needed to return that permission slip by a specific date or, or otherwise let me know. Um, and so if we, didn't, if we didn't hear from parents, we assumed that they were okay with, with the, the testing. Um, I also followed up by email with students and parents just to make sure that there was a lot of communication. Um, and as I said, in the end, um, we, did, we did test 61 students. Uh, some did make it in because of absence. I would say about 10% uh, of that 85 did defer uh, or did opt out, um, and another 10% didn't show up. Uh, Again, to, to, to get some by, this, this did, was not done with a lot of fanfare in the school because, again, we weren't testing a large group of sophomores all at once. Teachers were notified, daily lists were sent out, but it had minimal in, impact or dis disruption. Um, we did send out, Dr. Janger sent out a community news post announcing that this was happening. Um, parent, there were parent and student letters, and uh, I prepared parent and student information sessions. They. The rec one recommendation was the rather corny pizza for pizza, um, and when you offer students pizza, they will come. Uh, so I actually had uh, about maybe 10 parents show up uh, to learn about this before it happened, and about 25 of the students came after school um, to learn a little bit about the test. Uh, so I also have included a link uh, to the, the, the data report that is published with this is, is fairly substantial. It's over 150 pages um, of charts and graphs and uh, tables. Um, one, so some of the, this is just sample data that is not our school, um, where it says your school. Um, but it will tell us, again, in, in the different domains, reading, science, and math, how our students compare. Um, with students in uh, other countries around the world and with uh, other schools in the United States. Um, it will break those, d those scores down even further um, in terms of how our students will perform, again, here as far as uh, different levels of reading comprehension. Some other data that, that a test like the MCAS will not provide us with information such as based on the student's self-reporting, how they describe themselves as readers. Do they read extensively? Um, when, do they read a lot? Um, when they read, do they, do they skim? Do they read deeply? And then correlate some of that information uh, then with how they, act, how they perform. So perhaps I think we found, uh, I think this uh, chart that suggested that students who read um, a lot but maybe more superficially actually perform better than students who read less, or maybe it's the other way around, but I, it's a little blurry for me, um, than students who read less but more deeply. Um, so, uh, and, and then questions that we'll, we'll talk about how our, how our students uh, perform based on their, uh, and correlate that with information about school climate, um, how they feel about their relationships with their teachers, whether or not there is a sense of order uh, in, in their classrooms. Um, so again, uh, information about teacher-student relations. Again, comparing that to the highest and lowest lev performing levels of schools in the United States. Um, so it will be interesting to see where our school ranks there. Um, as I mentioned, the, the data our, our results will be co are being going to be compared with the 2015 administration of the PISA, um, and I believe they're still working on uh, that comparison so that the information, the report will be available to us in September. Uh, it's, we, 
as far as I know, we have not, we, we have not yet created a plan as to how this information, uh, <coughs> how this report might be used. I imagine that there will be a lot of parties who would be interested in seeing it. Um, you know, the science department, the English department, the math department, will, I'm sure, will be interested in looking at the scores. Um, so there are all, all sorts of possibilities of data, of data teams. We can certainly, sh you know, decide, you know, share that information with the, with the public, um, with the, the community. Um, it's, it's, it's possible that we will look at, at, at some of this information as we plan for the, uh, the, the high school renovation and think about the, the way we want to do instruction in, in a new school um, and see if there are information from this that we can uh, use. Um, and again, this does provide us with access to uh, professional development um, resources and conferences, um, which you know we will be invited to even before we have received this data. Um, so we will so obviously at, at the high school level in, in, encourage teachers uh, to, to take advantage of some of those experiences. Um, and these organizations are ones that are really focused on um, you know, a deeper level of learning and 21st century skills such as criti critical thinking, problem solving, um, and then also, you know, executive function and recognizing the interplay between the, the cognitive and interpersonal domain. So, um, that's, I believe. That's Thank you, Paul. Yes. Let's, let's open up for questions. Anybody have any questions for Mr. McKnight? Go ahead, Kirsty. Um, I had one question about the age of the kids who were selected. You said 15-year-old sophomores. Did they have to be 15 in March? Um, I believe that they had to be. Uh, let me see if I can get this right. Uh, it was between 15 years and three months, and 16 years and two months. I believe there was there was there okay, was. Okay, so there was a there was okay, a range. so there was yeah. a yeah range uh, because. Otherwise, you're kind of skewing for the younger kids in the class, mm -hmm. um, and I was just wondering about that. Okay. Yeah. So, th th yeah, there there was, th they um, they they set a range. I, I believe 15 years to three months, to 16 years to two months, mm -hmm. and um, the 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 software the software that the random did the randomly selection uh, random selection automatically looked at birth dates mm -hmm. um and selected on the basis of that okay um oh by the way I, one thing to add uh, uh, add to that um the only one thing that was not random was there's an equal rep representation of uh by gender okay uh, so. um, can, I just, uh, can I add one thing to that? we did decide sophomores because there could be right those ages and it, and right. it was really to have a common curriculum experience as well as in within the age. That, that's right. We that's, that is correct, that. yes. Okay. It didn't necessarily have to be sophomores. It could be 15-year-olds. So it could have in, a concluded freshmen as well. But we, we thought having the, the curriculum experience uh, of the freshman and part of the sophomore year would, was important. OK. Um, one more. Um, and then in one of the slides, you talk about how the results can be used to compare to other schools. And I'm wondering, what are these other schools? You know, how are they select? Ha, what? Yeah, so the, so how many are there? Um, how are they selected? What are they like? You know, how much are? How much like us are they? How much different? That's a very good. That's a very good question. I I, I think there would be. Um, I I I'm not sure of the answer to that. I do believe that there are several. There are several hundred schools within the United States. Um, who have participated in this? Um, it may be more. It may be more than that. Um, so we are only we are only looking at a a sample of a sample, in, in that sense of American schools to see how we compare with those. So it's it's yeah we're we're being compared. Our our performance is going to be compared with the other schools who have signed on to do yeah. to do this. Um, what information? that is provided, what explanatory information is provided in the data report may help to answer that question if we, if there's average in terms of like school size, location, we did, you know, we, we, we did provide all that information in terms of the, the, the enrollment at our school, what type of school we were. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mr. Schlickman. Okay. Um, 
In terms of a cost-benefit analysis, and because obviously there's a cost in terms of uh, doing this work within the schools in terms of staff time, student time, uh, how did we weigh the cost versus benefit of participating in, in, in this assessment? When, what was the, um, the argument that persuaded me to move forward with the high school is that uh, in addition we'll look at the schools in this country, it's looking also how Arlington High School is doing a, a, in a global educational world. Because what we want to be able to see is is whether um, our students are, how our students are doing in these more complex problem solve problems that are in the that are in this exam, which, from what I understand, are probably a little bit closer to what we're looking for in the 21st century mm -hmm. than what we are currently assessing at the state level. Mm -hmm. It's also just a, a, a wider, um, it's just a, it's a wider comparison. But I think we're more, I think the most compelling thing is really looking at how our students do, um, again, and how they apply their knowledge to new and complex problems. Uh, what does OECD stand for and who are they? It, it's the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. So I believe it's um, our organization of about, I can't remember the exact number, it's somewhere between like 16 and 23 countries um, throughout, throughout the world um, uh, that, that have been uh, associated uh, as part of, you know, as part of, uh, I, I think most of them are fairly developed, con that are fairly strongly developed countries, and one of the the things that they that they wanted to work on was to w look at the way um, to you know come up with this uh, this one f a formal assessment that they could use to kind of compare students um, uh, with from one country you know around the world to see measure their performance. That's uh, and my last question is, will the data from this assessment be shared with the committee? Of, of course. Mm -hmm. Of course it will be. Mm -hmm. And, and um, Paul has agreed that he's pretty much going to help um, lead, the, lead the way next year in mm -hmm. terms of the, the data and how the data could be used by the high school. Mm -hmm. This is also an initiative mm -hmm. and supported by the Department of Education in Massachusetts because uh, Massachusetts does very well, in fact, does better, ranks number one on the NAEP and, and certainly in other measures as well. But they really want to take a look at um, how we're doing on a more global kind of assessment. Um, while I think that the new MCAS 2.0 is a little bit more in that vein, and it will be interesting for us to take a look as we look at the questions in the MCAS 2.0 to um, the types of questions that we're seeing here. See, the thing is that the high school, we're, we're, the high school assessment for 10th grade, I don't think this has changed that substantially mm -hmm. from, it ha from the last few years. Mm -hmm. And it won't for a while. We're, what we're seeing is really the new version in K-8. So if, if if we're moving in a certain direction, how can we have a little bit more dipsticking into really how we're doing? And I'm expecting that we're going to do well, but if we're not, you know, in certain areas, then this is this is good information for us in terms of what we want to do with um, both the the curriculum and as well as um, pedagogy. Thank you. Any more questions? Anybody want to ask any questions? Okay. Thank you very much for coming. It was great. Thank you very great much for giving the opportunity. All right, next we have uh, Larry Weathers and Corey Bavuso, uh, who are going to give a presentation and an update on what's happening in science. Okay. And prior to the meeting, Larry gave us a bunch of materials that we're going to use, <laughs> that you want back at the end of the uh, presentation, right? You want these back? Oh, I think. Yes, please, <laughs> okay. please, please. All right. Well, thank you again for inviting us with you our, uh, our challenges and our successes. So uh, some of the um, slides I'm going to show are repeats of last year's, 
with new data in it that show um, you know where we've moved to. So first, I'd like to introduce to you Corey Bavuso. We, she doesn't need an introduction as a teacher because she's been here for about ten years. But she um, was at a point where she decided to stretch and uh, take on some challenges, and we knew that we had a brand new elementary science curriculum with no additional support. So Corey has, has uh, been doing a yeoman's job of, of working with the elementary teachers, uh, providing professional development for them, helping them to, to figure out ways to organize materials and ways to, to kind of ease the content into the lives of the elementary school teachers. Um, and to start with some writing examples and notebooking. And so she's been engaged in that and we've been just uh, very happy about the fact that the elementary teachers are supported in their science curriculum now. So when, when we get to a few elementary things, Corey will talk about what she's been doing and you know, we'll go from there. So what do I do here, Karen? Is this a left-right thing? Yeah, okay. Our mission, and it's right from our, our literature, our department literature. You know, we really want to make science embedded in all our kids' uh, awareness. It's, it's that kind of a world, and, and they need to have the habits of mind of thinking about science to be critical. And that isn't any different than it is in any other discipline. It's just takes a, it has a different language, and, and there are some different practices. So we have been focusing uh, quite a bit on the, on the last one here, science-specific literacy and reading, writing, and the mathematics necessary for career and college readiness. So um, I have distributed examples of some of our writing, and I'll come back to those in a little bit. But those are examples from grade three, where Corey has started working with the elementary science notebooking through grade seven and eight where we have books on cells and books, children's books on science topics, uh, uh, fiction books on science topics, where kids are expected to use the terminology, explain the principles as if you were talking to a five-year-old. Uh, we have a, a new publication this year. It's called Science Weekly in the eighth grade, where the, the kids, um, they, they read a science fiction novel, and then they comment on the science in it, about the reality of it or the fantasy of it, and have to make some judgments about that. But all of this, again, is getting to, um, to get kids to express their thoughts, to clarify them in writing, and to really uh, think about you know, embedding that kind of habit in, in their normal practice. There are examples there from um, our 11th and 12th grade elective of archaeology, where some of you may have seen the lawn being dug up now and then, and hopefully nobody stepped into the holes, but we mark them quite well. Uh, where the kids have, have been digging and picking up artifacts, and they found, I forget, it, they're in the, uh, there are pictures of them in those uh, journals that you see from cow bones to porcelain and whatever that are, you know, in the order of 100 years old. So, and they catalog these and describe them and they're going through all the standard techniques of archeology. span And uh, this journal is created by the students. Uh, I think you'll find it's, it's quite high quality writing and uh, as is fitting for one of our capstone courses. So, uh, I'll move on quickly. So we have new standards. They came out a little more than a year ago. Uh, they won't be tested until next year. And so we're still, we're still getting into the groove, in a sense, of figuring out how to shift over to these standards. We've started that process. And this is for the uh, elementary and middle. The high school will probably be tested a year later, although we don't know that for sure. So um, 
you want to talk about this, Corey? Sure. So um, thank you, Larry, for the wonderful introduction. <laughs> um, Our pleasure. <laughs> I was really excited to be able to go into a third grade classroom to prepare for running a PD session for the third grade teachers. Um, I was going to help them look at how they could increase the amount of science practices that they were including in their lessons and um, how they could use science journaling and notebooking to do that. So in my research, since I actually had never been into a third grade classroom before, I went and observed in um, Dallin, and the kids were so excited and enthusiastic, um, just getting to measure beans and cut lima beans in half. They were dissecting seeds and things. It was really cool just to see how, you know, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed the, the third graders were. So that was really exciting for me. A little bit different than high schoolers. Um, <laughs> although high schoolers, they're excited about science too. So the kids were doing a lab about um, the, what are seeds, what's the function of seeds, how do seeds grow. And so one of the activities is a seed soak lab where they put the seeds in some water and they observe them growing overnight and we were looking at the change in size and how could we tell what, how much bigger they had gotten and the kids figured out that we should look at the mass and so we were comparing the masses before and after and it was uh, it was just really it was really neat and then they have all of these opportunities to write about what they think is going to happen in their journal take notes of their observations explain why that happened and sort of using science vocabulary to do all of that and so after having seen that I did a PD session for the um, third grade teachers and I, we modeled this activity with those teachers and talked a little bit about, uh, I don't think Larry has put them up yet, but the eight science practices that are part of the NGSS, um, how you can actually address each of those eight science practices by notebooking. And so we went through a bunch of examples. We're looking into a resource um, that's provided by the EBEC, which is the? Which is what? What's it stand for? Oh, East Bay Educational Collaborative. East Bay Educational Collaborative. And they have kind of a different take on notebooking where they have some, some pre-set up graphic organizers for kids to be filling in just to um, let them focus a little bit more on the science and a little bit less on copying terminology and, and writing out sentences. And it's going to be up to the teachers to decide how they want to weigh the pros and cons of having the kids create their own notebooks, which is really cool and really powerful. Um, and how, but they also have a limited amount of time to do their science. So we're sort of looking at how can how can notebooking help, and then what are some of the different options for notebooking? Thank you. Mm -hmm. So these are the practices, you know, the, uh, the, what we used to call inquiry skills, but the word inquiry meant so many different things that now call them practices. So, uh, but these are the skills that scientists use as they do their normal work. So we're, we're trying to have the kids model those and really do them. Uh, and, you know, and, and this whole FOSS program, and as we're increasing our use of writing in the middle and high school, in science, uh, you know, we, we see the kind of, you know, when, when a student can explain what they see and think about something in writing, not only do they improve their retention of it, but they clarify what their thinking is. You know, by the time they go through a few drafts, it starts to get clearer in their minds. So we're really seeing some effects of that. So. Uh, some other things, you know, it, this is not about the writing, but we're, we really want to uh, integrate technology more and more. You know, the, thanks again to the AEF for providing some infrared cameras. These are two examples of uh, student handprints. You put a hand down on a table and, you, and then you photograph the table afterwards and you see where it was warmer, where it wasn't. The photo on the right is uh, 
a hand underneath, partly underneath a blanket. So you can see part way up the arm, you can see the heat being radiated, and down below that, it's more of a uniform temperature. So kids are exploring science principles through visual technology and things that we can't see normally. So, um, and again, the writing component in the eighth grade, you, you see examples of the children's storybooks, the technology review, the cell books. We have this going on in every grade, uh, and it's, it's growing. Uh, moving to the high school, we have a lot of courses. We have some great, um, we're, we're increasing our digital options, although in a discussion today, we you know, acknowledge that sometimes as new digital options come up, they, they aren't as, uh, they're, no, they're not silver bullets. We have to figure out how to use them effectively. And, uh, it's, it's a new strategy for teachers. Um, the Journal of um, Amateur Field Archaeology, you see the, the issues of that here and continuing that. Every semester that goes through archaeology produces one of those journals, totally by the student. Uh, this is another area of, of increased um, involvement. One of the practices back a few slides ago was modeling and, and we, we have really been starting to delve into how do we use models more effectively they're used all over the place in science and in politics and in in economics and whatever and the students should have more experience with that so this is an example the uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change worldwide group that has was instrumental in the paris accord use the model that we're using now. And it was developed at MIT. And several weeks ago, the environmental AP teacher and I it took six students there for a training session. And so some of this is, is them using that modeling. It's in, a, it's in a UN kind of environment, you know, where there are countries that are negotiating for climate change. Or, or the factors that will affect it. You know, how much, what, what are we do, gonna do with taxes? And what are you gonna do with commitment towards studies? And this and that. And, and so the model runs through, you can see on the bottom left here, it, it's a very, very precise model. And it, it uses, you know, of course it's a model, it's not the reality. But it puts in the, the student data and it actually makes a calculation of how much you've changed the climate how much you've lowered the climate, the, the temperature increase. By. And, and, um, and it's, uh, it's a robust model. This is the model that was used at the Paris Accord. And, and so we brought those six students back, and they are now uh, implementing that model in all of the environmental classes. So they're, they're being the leaders. So we want to continue with our modeling efforts uh, in all kinds of ways. Uh, we have some great awards this year. So uh, National Teacher of the Month for January, Danielle Rad, our archaeology teacher. And uh, that was from the American Association for Advancement of Science, the producers of Science Magazine. So, uh, and then sitting next to me, Corey Bavu. So some of the uh, regional science um, associations give awards for excellence in teaching. Corey received one, and she, she'll actually get the award in a few weeks, but she was already acknowledged for it in the Outstanding Science Educator, and uh, we're proud of that. So, um, so this is just a rundown of our courses, and as you can see, our electives uh, are numerous, and they're capstone courses. We expect the kids to use all the sciences when they take one of those electives. And um, our AP program keeps growing. Last year I showed you the first four lines of this, and now as we are enrolling kids for next year, and we're not done yet, uh, I'm projecting that there are possibly 10 sections. It's, it, it will certainly be nine, and it's, it's looking like 10 right now. So what that, 
the saying is, you know, down below you can see our re requests for these courses are greater, and we're not done yet because enrollment is still going on. Um, so we, you know, we're proud of that, and at the same time we want to be watchful. We don't want to overdo AP courses where it's not appropriate. We want to see how uh, how students manage them. We don't want them to take more than they can manage, and, and uh, so we're trying to be watchful on both sides of that. The scores are growing. Last year, I reported, you know, various courses and the percents of threes, fours, and five, and this year you can see it's grown. A little dip, but sometimes it's cohort-related and it's, it's hard to look at just for one year, but, but um, we're proud of the Enviro going from 46 to 73, and, um, and everybody in biology was a three, four, or five, so. Uh, sorry, I didn't realize that this would be so small. So last year I showed you the left two groupings of graphs. Bottom graph is all students, top graph high need students. And going from 14 to 15, we increased quite a bit in our, uh, in our uh, proficient category. And this year, or, or from last spring, you know, we dipped a little bit, but if we look back four years, it just goes up and down. There's a little cyclic pattern to it. Uh, so we're keeping track of that. You know, we, we analyze the data. We look for ways we can improve. Uh, there's, still, there's still room to grow there. And um, I always show this graph. I know that uh, class size is, is, by research, shown not to be a real significant indicator of student success. But it is in terms of student accidents in class, in lab classes. So uh, one, of our, one of our continued goal is to, goals is to really watch the class sizes in laboratory classes. You can see that after, after 24 here, it starts to rise. And by 28, it rises significantly. So that's one of our, our challenges and our concerns, you know, for a number of reasons, staffing, room availability, uh, building adequacy, you know, and all that. So um, we want to keep our eyes on that. So that's, that's the nutshell. So if you have any questions. Questions, anyone? Strand. How big are the chemistry classes, the labs, students? Well, we have some that are, uh, oh, how, how many students? In uh, a lab. We, we, we try to keep the, the kids who are, um, who, who choose the advanced level as opposed to the honors level. We try to keep those smaller. Those tend to be uh, in the low 20s, 20 to 22, 23, which is a good number and we're happy with that. But in order to do that, the honors level sections are more. And those, the students can generally handle that, but sometimes it just gets more than we have the facility for. So some of our honors level classes are up to 30. I mean, sure. Are they doubling up at the stations? Your, your, your labs aren't set up for 30 students, are they? No. So no. they're- No, they, we have- I'm just concerned- We on have the tables on the side right. that act as lab stations. I'm just we, concerned on a safety basis, that's all for the-, the Groups of four. Wow. You have what? Groups of four, usually. Groups of four, and, and I know in, in some of Corey's uh, anatomy classes, uh, the sections are huge, and we've had to bring in extra tables as lab stations. So those are... Don't misunderstand me. I think pro the programs are exciting, uh, the growth in them. Uh, I can remember science, more or less, I'm ancient, tapering off. The enthusiasm was there at the elementary level, and because it became very almost static at the the high school level. I think uh, we're growing. I, I think it's fantastic. Just by looking at the environmental, the astronomy, the, uh, the other courses. I, I, yeah, I and we're- I really we're, congratulate you. I'm just concerned about safety yes. in, the, in the lab course. That's so all. are we, and you know, we, we do all the things we can. We make sure our safety equipment is there. We have it checked. We, uh, 
you know, we, we watch the desks, we try to arrange things so that the, the lab areas have a little bit more mo motion uh, ability and without kids, you know, kids can bump into each yes. other's uh, elbows in a, in a basketball court, let alone in a <laughs> science lab. So um, Thank you. we're trying to watch that. On the, on the FOSS kits, can you uh, remind me, where are we on the rollout? Are we fully rolled out? Is this the first year? What's, where, where, what's the status? We are rolled out fully from first to fifth grade. So this was the first year for fourth and fifth to have their kits. But um, did thir third, all third teachers had them last year, third grade and second? Right. Some second and some first. We, we have a, a demographic adjustment we're continuing to make. For example, uh, as our school population grows, if we look back four years ago or so, almost every elementary school, every most of the elementary schools had three classrooms per grade level. Now, probably more than half of them, I, I would say, have four. So as, as those numbers move along, we're having to buy extra kits. So we just bought, in a sense, a, a half rollout for next year so that all those uh, buildings that have four classrooms in a, in a grade will have adequate uh, numbers of kits. So we're still doing that and it'll take, uh, it takes a little while for the teachers to adjust to the new science practices, to be more inquiry oriented. And, and so even though the equipment rollout is just about done, I think the, uh, the teacher growth is still is still progressing, and it will for a few years. Uh, is there is there more PD planned for that? It, it, I did hear some discomfort from some of the teachers about what they were supposed to do with the kits and the PD not following, not being timely with when the kits were rolled out and stuff. Yeah, we definitely have a lot of PD. Corey, can you talk about the new program we're going to have next year? Yes. Sure. Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Great, great. Um, I have volunteers or um, stipend. stipended positions from teachers from each of the grades, one through five. And our first goal is to get together this summer and start looking at some resources that we can put together to um, help make everybody's life easier. And we have a website where we're gonna start compiling all of these things that we come up with, um, revised scope and sequences, uh, snapshot lessons, anything that we can think of that will sort of streamline things for the teachers. And then in the fall, the same group of teachers hopefully will again get a new stipend to help us plan PD. And so they'll start looking at what things would be the most useful and, and then being able to try to put things together where we can model those skills and support the teachers a little bit better that way by sort of asking them what they need. So we're, we're calling them teacher leaders and so uh, science teacher leaders. And uh, so that hopefully will help a bit the other, another thing we're exploring is um, we would rather have our teachers working with the kids directly on content and not fiddling with counting the straws that are in the kits or the wheels or, or whatever. So we're exploring models for that. And there are a number of them out there. Some cost more, some cost less. And we're looking at ways that we might be able to uh, work with some, some partners that will help to refurbish those kits bring them back to the teachers, have them ready to go, take that time away from the teachers, uh, you know, the uh, nuts and bolts work, and have them working with the kids more. So. thing that uh, I think more about than anything else, because I think that you guys are doing a great job, but uh, you mentioned facilities and context, and uh, that we're embarking on a high school project, and we're also opening up new classrooms and new science classrooms over the Gibbs, and we're going to be able to have a little more space to work with at the Odyssey. So I guess my question to you is just maybe a 30-second off the top of your head wish list dream vision for what science classrooms might look at at Arlington High School after, uh, after we're done with the building project. That's, uh, that's a good and challenging question, uh, only because there are, there are a lot of options, and of course our wish list is, 
it, it's like a kid in a candy shop, you know. Yeah, I mean, and that's I want to know about the candy. That's what we <laughs> should be doing. And, and uh, we have been going around visiting schools that have recent building projects, uh, Weston, Winchester, and others, and trying to get examples. We, we're seeing things that are common, that, are, that look really good. Mm -hmm. And uh, now it's a matter of, of course, there are constraints from the uh, MSBA, mm -hmm. and there are uh, constraints from dollars, and we have to see what we can work with, and, but it's gonna be a whole lot better. I mean, programmatically, we can define things that we think we need in terms of our curriculum going, uh, going yes, towards yes. the MSBA because it's not a number alone just based on enrollment count. So I'm encouraging you to, right. to really be um, thoughtful about uh, how, how you're mapping out your hopes and dreams. Great. I, I, I'm glad to hear that support. That, that is what we're trying to do. In fact, we were trying to start to, to uh, imp, not implement, but to select a new curriculum at the Otteson so that when the move to the Gibbs occurred, mm -hmm. uh, we'd be ready to go with some brand new stuff. Mm -hmm. We're starting new standards then, new testing is occurring, we've got new rooms, so why not have a new curriculum? Mm -hmm. And what ended up happening is that because the standards in science are so new, mm -hmm. the publishers, you know, there's that lag time and they're just coming out with the new programs. Mm -hmm. And so we, we were zeroing in on one we thought was really pretty good. Mm -hmm. And two weeks later, another one comes out that looks a whole lot better. Mm -hmm. So we have slowed down that process so that we can just let that lag get beyond us a little bit. And, and, and so that by maybe next fall, we'll be ready to make some recommendations that way. Because we thought that there are too many good things coming out right now that if we, if we just chose one now, we probably wouldn't have necessarily the best option. Uh, and I know that a lot of people are looking at tradition, Arlington High tradition. I hope the one that we don't keep is the pillars in the middle of the labs. <laughs> All right. Oh, we're so nostalgic about that, those, though. You know, I mean, we're, what would we do without them? Like a Fenway Park obstructed view. Yeah. Well, the utilitarian part of those is we hang skeletons from them. Uh -huh. We mm -hmm. mount projector shelves on them, and you know, but half the kids in the room can't see the Paint teacher. DNA models on them. <laughs> Larry that, and Curry, thank you so much for you're being welcome. here. You're welcome. Yes. Great presentation. Thank we you. appreciate it. We're going to pass oh. your uh, your materials to the left. Oh, this, this is... Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. This is Larry. This is fun stuff. Thank you, Larry. Yeah, great. I'm glad you enjoyed that. If you ever want to see more of it, let's... Uh, Thank you very much. You want to see some Yeah. Okay. All right. So, we now have Dr. Bodie's update, Superintendent's report. Thank you. You're on the air. All right. <laughs> I have quite a few things that I want to update everybody about. Um, the first uh, first bullet, of course, are always our update about the buildings, and let me just give you a quick um, quick thumbnail sketches of where we are. You heard we we're talking about the high school as we look forward uh, to uh, the the project beginning. We're in a sort of a slow to go fast kind of mode in that we we need to have the uh, owners project manager selected. That that will, we're in that process now. The, the first um, proposals, the proposals, I should say, the first proposals will be due, I think, May 8th. And we will go through the process and bring our selection to MSBA in early July. Then we will begin the designer part of the, uh, the project in selecting the designer. And, and then that's when, it's, after the designer is selected, that's when it's gonna really start moving quickly. And the work that, um, uh, Mr. Weather was talking about in thinking about the curriculum, what kind of space would be best suited for the curriculum, um, how many classrooms we need uh, for the science, all of that is going to be something that's going to be key to what this building, what the design of this building is going to be. So that will be happening next year for sure. Um, with Gibbs, we are moving forward quite well in the planning for the, the renovation. 
We have, as you know, a Gibbs Advisory Committee, which met again last week, and uh, Ms. Starks is on that committee looking at designs and uh, I think this is going to be a little bit longer process than probably anticipated as we try to figure out what is the the design and color schemes that everyone feels really good about so we're in the process Stratton uh, I did uh, a tour uh, this last week just to see where things stood and um, we are about 75 percent of the way through the actual goal is to have the classroom wings available to teachers I think it's uh, the 22nd of June mm -hmm. and I think judging from where they are right now I think that's quite quite possible what will happen once that once the teachers are able to start moving boxes is that the part of the building that is the, the cafeteria the um, so sort of the kindergarten area too and the gym that will now be cordoned off and that will be the focus of the summer work so that everything is ready for the start of school I will say that the new windows in the building really make a huge difference in terms of the light in the building those of you that are familiar with the corridors particularly the bottom floor which is always so dark it's it's opened up completely in terms of light and I, I think it would be great for the committee to have it, an opportunity to go visit as well. In fact, do, is there a date per, for the Permanent Town Permanent Building? Building Committee is meeting uh, for next Tuesday early for us to do a tour, and then we're going to have our regular meeting then. Uh, I don't think there'd be an issue with school committee members going I, on that. I, I, know one that, I know one that's going, but uh, the, I don't want to speak for John. You, you talk to John. I don't, I don't think there'd be a problem with that at all. I don't think no, so either. So I could ask about that. Thompson it's Tuesday night and I think it's at five I'll look it up for when they're doing the tour just so. okay Thompson's deal is going up it's not completely up yet but it is going up so we're, we're the permanent town building committee has requested a revised um, schedule yeah. and that will be delivered to them I believe on Tuesday, Tuesday night the our project manager rejected this time schedule because they crunched it um, and he said they said they're going to make it on time in fact they even indicated they're going to be three days early and he said well show us a, a schedule that has all the uh, subcontractors committed to do that because with that's crunch schedule before before you finish Thompson I have a request for you so before you I'd, I'd like to suggest the possibility that we ha I don't want it to happen but have plan B uh, ready just in case uh, so we're not in a reactive mode in the middle of the summer and if you if possible bring it to us uh, before we the plan. end we already have plan B figured out for the school I don't like plan B but we have it figured out um, does that include using the library I hope not most likely yes it depends okay. it depends on what happens with kindergarten and what I do with buffer zones over the next couple of months it's it's very it's complicated I can I'll talk about that in a, in a minute enrollment numbers for kindergarten yes I think our biggest issue actually in terms of the plan B is less about the school um, than it is about what to do about parks and rec we are since we did not know whether we were going to need the modulars and for how long we would need the modulars next year we have we're on under contract for a year which actually turns out to be a, a blessing in disguise because in moving uh, Parks and Rec programs out of Gibbs they need a place to be and they have two programs that are going to utilize the uh, modulars once they're available one is the, uh, their preschool program and the second is their after-school program one of the really com uh, pressure increasing pressure that's happening district-wide is the need for after-school <coughs> programming and right now the park and recs program has uh, 40 children in the program turns out the majority of those or a little over half those are Thompson children so it would be actually quite convenient that that it's there but that program will probably be fine it's the daytime preschool that will be of issue as we try to figure this out but we are we we are there we actually have been talking about this for a couple of months as we've been concerned about the uh, the time schedule then um, the Hardy 
Well, that will be discussed at town meeting at the special town meeting, which is April 26th. And um, there'll be the vote in terms of, uh, of whether we can go forward, the town meeting will vote appropriation and whether we can go forward from there. But the idea that we would be sort of paralleling the same kind of process we've gone through with Thompson so that it would be a year out and Hardy would have six classrooms the following year, starting in September. So those are the quick updates and where we are with um, all the projects. Actually, even though Hardy is not actually active, it has taken up a considerable amount of time this year in sort of planning, so we are at town meeting ready to go with a plan. Any questions about building before Dr. Wood goes into the job? Mm -hmm. um, the preschool, am I understanding correctly that they're building, they're renovating another building that's separate from the schools? Or is this a different preschool? Different. Uh, it's different. a different one. Okay. Yes, there was two there preschool two programs. Okay. This is Park and Recreation Program. Okay. Other questions about buildings? All right. Part Go two. Go on. Part two. <clears throat> All right. Um, just so you're aware, um, I've been collaborating with other people, writing a statement about the Arlington Public Schools position on immigration and refugee immigrant students and, and refugee students and I, I, I sent that out today I sent you a copy of it but increasingly over the last few months uh, the concerns um, are growing about what what does the, what is the position of the Arlington Public Schools with respect to information about immigration status we do not collect that information during a registration process. Um, it is not a question we ask because the, the law is very clear that students can be educated in this country regardless of their immigration status. That was decided by um, the Supreme Court back in 1982 and we certainly abide by that. We are also, um, and rightly so, very, we, um, constrained by the federal regulations around how, how student information or how can be disseminated and essentially is that we do not give out student information. Um, there would be only very um, particular circumstances when that would happen and it would require um, uh, a subpoena. But in addition to that, I wanted to make sure that people understood that even if we found out inadvertently that the immigration status of a student, we do not contact any federal agencies with that information. And I think that's important for people to know. So that is out there, but in addition to that, we've also found some resources, and actually some of the resources you, you said were good resources um, that we're, we're sending out to parents as well. So that is, that's there and I think it's important for people to really understand um, that we are a school district that is committed to educational equity and to respect and the dignity of all of our students and families and that is something that we that was we we're talking about and whether we we're talking about transgender students uh, students uh, with disabilities whatever students we we are committed to um, creating a safe environment for those students so that, um, some more, uh, some, I, I want, since we're talking about town meeting, let me just also let you know that John, uh, our moderator, Leone, will be announcing the first day that budgets will be taken up on May 3rd. <coughs> there are other articles that affect the schools, but May 3rd is going to be the day that we're going to have budgets. So we might want to talk about, you know, that that's the night that we want to have the, town, the time that the school committee gives their report to town meeting. So that's something we can think about. I also want to tell you that we have at the printers right now the uh, budget book and report to town meeting. And in fact, we probably could get that out to you in a um, um, PDF form. I'd have to, it's, it's such a large document. Mm -hmm. We have to wait really to get it onto a, a site so that we can give you the link rather than uh, 
give you the whole document, but it's essentially parallel to that what we had in past years with all the budget information as well as reports from every principal and curriculum leader about the highlights of this year. And I did want to mention um, in light of this question that Mr. Slickman asked, you know, what is the cost benefit mm -hmm. of the kind of um, <coughs> effort with respect to this kind of testing? When you are a school and a school district that is is always looking to improve, then one of the ways you do it, part of that loop, is the loop of assessments looking at the data and then moving forward with the kind of changes that are necessary. And I think that the work that we're doing in this area is, come, is uh, recognized in various ways. As you can see, we have two science teachers who are recognized for their work. By the way, um, uh, Ms. Bavuso, she, while she is also helping elementary, she's still a teacher in the high school mm -hmm. um, and teaches, I think, three courses in yes. the high school. But um, in the book that we're giving to town meeting, uh, we also can report that the high school received the gold medal distinction again in U.S. News & World Report Best High School ra uh, Rankings. This year, um, AHS ranked 16th among the Massachusetts school up from 19 the year before and remains in the top 2% of schools nationally. In terms of uh, science, technology, and engineering, ranking uh, number uh, 193rd na nationally. So it's, we're recognized for the work we're doing. That's not our goal is to have high rankings. Our goal is to be able to provide the best education we can for our students in an environment that is welcoming and warm because we don't want our students also to be so driven that they are become anxious, distressed mm -hmm. students. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that that can have a um, very serious consequences when that's your environment in the school. And so that another thing that we'll find out from that survey that was just done is, is getting some, uh, a little bit of dipstick into that, those kind of questions also. Um, I want to like, um, also give you a quick update. Actually, I can ask Dr. Chesson to give you a quick update on how we're doing with MCAS testing right now. So we are just about done um, with Audison in the ELA um, and are uh, halfway through the elementaries. Um, as you recall, grade four is doing the test online and grade six, seven, and eight at Audison are all doing it online. Um, we have had a couple of very minor um, technical issues. We had one that would, is considered minor in its perspective in the sense that we had about 1,200 students were um, testing. We had three that had technical issues. I'm sure for their parents and those students, it's not considered minor, but we um, have worked through it. Um, we did find out uh, today that uh, one other district had one student who also had the same technical issue, so it's our belief that this is a Pearson issue. Um, but we put um, something, what happened was the students um, put in their testing information and when they hit submit, they got an error. Um, so we had three students out of about 1,100 who had that experience that were all testing on the same day. We found out another district also had one student who had that issue. So even though our tech department spent hours and hours trying to track it down, it's, it happened so infrequently that it was very difficult. And, and they did change one or two things, but they really don't think that those were the problems. Um, but the teachers can actually monitor online if a student um, is uh, progressing through the test. They can't see the student's answer, but they can see, oh, Johnny's on question three, Susie's on question four. So as a result, since that student's work wasn't being sent up to the, the server, um, we're now asking teachers to check um, at regular intervals to make sure that they see that every student in their class has answers that are going up to the server because had we checked that, um, and, and it's, it can only be done at certain intervals because as you can imagine, if you have, 25 kids that are testing in a class as each one is doing one question, you know, you're getting this rapid re revolution of screens, so you have to kind of pick a, a moment in time and go through every student. Um, but that will help us to at least catch if this, God forbid, happens again. It did not happen after that day, nor did it happen since that day, nor did it happen last year at all. So, you know, as it is many things as technical um, that happen with technology, um, you know, we have to kind of plan for the, the worst case scenario and, and hope for the best. So, sorry, so 
those three students for testing and their test results did come One up. day, one day's worth of testing. So not, um, so and actually one of the students, only half their test didn't go up, and the other two, their complete test for that day didn't go up. So did they have to repeat or were they excused? Um, they, we, they have, we reached out to the, the principal reached out to the parents and the parents chose in both cases to have the student retake the test. Um, the unfortunate part is we could mark the test being um, uh, not completed but with a technical issue, but that's not going to provide parents information regarding that student's ability to, you know, to handle the test. So um, they certainly could have chosen to do that, but what would have happened to the student would have received zeros for that day. It's not like the system has a capacity to only grade one portion of it. Uh, we prepared, or has DESI provided us the translation of MCAS 2 into what it was before against the standards and stuff? Um, the, or are the we gonna have a year without show? Are we going to be able to compare this year with past years? I'm sure there'll be a crosswalk, um, and you can. They haven't provided it yet. We have not received that yet. But how we have been notified that there will be four levels. Um, last year, if you remember, there were I, five I, levels. No, I for understand park. that. This I, year, there'll only that, be four levels. That's going to cause our own issue with that. But my concern is that we don't have. A, we're in a trial year, and it's understood. Mm -hmm. And you experienced a technical issue. But it happens with all things. But we put so much educational time into this. We have used it in the past as a tool of comparison. I would be very nervous if we now have to start our data collection as year one again. Well, I mean, again, there were crosswalks last year to, um, there was a crosswalk in the sense that they gave you a park score and then they told you what score that would have been in MCAS. So that we can certainly compare that information. But what will be more useful this year is that I anticipate that they will be releasing the questions that they use to give students a specific um, rating. And last year for Park, that was not released. So it, it, that in of itself will be an advantage to us that we did not have last year. You, and I, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but you're the one. Uh, will this be available at the beginning of the summer so that the, the, the teachers will have an opportunity as they have in the past to mm, do the analysis? Right now they're saying that we'll get the multiple choice results just about the same time we got them last year, which is about the end of June, beginning of July. But, not everybody, be, no, it's not than everybody than took the test online right, and that's right, why. It's better than October, November. Thank you. Well, yeah. And again, it's because everybody's not taking the test online. Okay, a few more things, yes. Uh, quick question. Uh, given the uh, findings on the electronic testing this year, uh, do we have? Do you think we have? We'll have the capacity going forward to test electronically across all grades next year. Uh, yes, we've come up with. We haven't didn't have a sufficient staff in order to be able to do that this year. Um, we're coming up with. Um, what we would need to do in terms of staffing to have that. There are individuals across the district that could be trained to provide the level of technical support um, that we weren't able to do uh, this year. Okay. Um, enrollment. We are, we've, we have um, been looking at our kindergarten enrollment and as of the other day, we are close to 460 students we are, but we are ahead of where we were at this time last year. I, we have about 70 students that are in buffer zones who are not siblings, and those, um, those assignments will be sent out by the end of the month, perhaps even at the end of next week, but certainly by the end of the month. And one of the reasons for getting these out is that we also want parents to know what school they're in so they can secure their after school programming. I know that what we're doing at Thompson and Hardy, because those are Arlington Public School programs, is that we are, well actually we're gonna do something new next year and the, the letter's going out probably today or tomorrow. We're actually gonna put in a kindergarten program both at, at Hardy for sure and possibly at, at Thompson. It depends whether we have, we, we need to do it at Thompson. And what that will do is it will expand um, our after school program by about 20%. So the kindergarten students will be in their own room for the first part of the after school and then will be integrated into other programs after that. 
it's a it's um it's a it's a decision to both to create more space for after school programming but also to um, introduce kindergartners to an after school type of program in a, in a, in a way that's a little bit more um, gentle and, and slow to get used to. So that's, that's happening. Uh, I don't, it's a little bit harder for our other schools to do this because it has to do with licensing of space. But um, the buffer zones, we've had, we've had a surprise, and one of the surprises is at Pierce where the number of uh, kindergarten students has really increased enough that we probably could have three kindergartens there next year, which has then a spiraling effect in terms of how we're going to use buffer zones to try to be strategic. And um, so we're waiting for another week of data before making some decisions, but hopefully that will all go out very soon. But 460 at this time tells us that we're going to certainly be in the high 400s, if not go over 500 again this year. Mm -hmm. I want to give um, uh, congratulations to the, the, um, the cast and the Performing Arts Department for <gasps> Crazy For You. It was spellbinding. Oh, it was. It's the it's only way to describe it. It was one of the most outstanding uh, plays that we've put on here at the high school mm -hmm. in years. But I think one of the things that was particularly um, interesting and commendable is that uh, through a gift of one of our chief supporters of performing arts, Carla DeFord, we were able to get the original choreography for the play. And, and as a result, some students learned the choreography and then taught all the other students. So we didn't really have an official choreographer this year. We had our students doing it, and they did an amazing mm -hmm. job. Amazing. I'm not an expert, but I got to tell you, and you, that adds that much more to it. They were in sync throughout that whole performance that I saw on a Sunday afternoon. It was spellbinding. Uh, it was just fantastic. So what you saw was the original play that had been performed, because sometimes there's an adaptation at, in a high school, but the thing that is amazing is that we had the talent. Mm -hmm. And the, so off. The, the two leads are sophomores, aren't they? Yes. Wow. Hmm. Yes. Now, coming up on, on the next month, Beauty and the Beast will be at the middle school the, week, the, um, the last weekend in April. And then the following weekend is the um, Arlington High School Pops at uh, Town Hall, both Saturday night and Sunday afternoon. So if any of you are interested in tickets, we probably can work something out for sure. Let me see if there's anything else here. No, that's it. Okay, thank you, uh, Kathy. Okay, so <clears throat> um, we'll uh, catch up and be at the consent agenda by 810, so <laughs> don't worry about that. Yeah. Uh, I wondered if you wanted to talk about uh, the vacancy in staffing and the assistant superintendent's position. Is it, it's posted? Yes. Okay. You want to confirm that? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, the job is posted. It's been posted. And we congratulate Dr. Chesson yes. on her yes. appointment as superintendent of the Barnstable. No, Gr Groton Dunstable. Groton Dunstable. Groton Dunstable. Dunstable. Wrong direction. <laughs> Groton Dunstable School District. Um, I spoke to the uh, chair of the search committee and I said all these uh, great, great things about Laura. So we're very excited for you. We're sad for us and we're excited to see you take on a superintendency. Well, thank you. And I look forward to a successful completion of negotiations in Groton Dunstable. <laughs> yeah, we can take care of that. As I keep telling Mr. Steer, St Mr. Th uh, Spiegel, uh, you know, I haven't signed my contract yet, so. <laughs> a mere, mere detail. Okay, so the, yes, so the job. Yeah, it's been posted, we're moving forward to fill it. Great, thank you. Any other questions? I'm sorry to cut you off. Okay, so uh, school committee calendar. So I uh, took something that Jennifer Seuss uh, put together, and um, I also put on the back three pa back four pages, three pages, um, all the policies that I could think of that have <coughs> deadlines. Yeah. Um, and I went through the, you know, I went to the policy book, um, and that you know, election of school committee officers, school committee subcommittees, um, <coughs> the date language is an exact quote from the policy itself. So it's how the policy reads. Um, a couple of things to point out. The district-wide goal setting process by May 15th, the superintendent submits goals to the school committee. 
uh, policy revision and review. There's a policy that says by June 1st, the committee chaired by Mr. Cardin um, is supposed to report back on which sections of the policy manual it intends to examine during the next 12 months. Um, we have to take into account the fact that last uh, term we voted to do a policy review with MASC. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> policy CBI lays out um, the role of, uh, you know, our, of the committee in, in engaging with the superintendent on her goals. Um, our, our practice has been that the, that the uh, Curriculum Instruction Assessment Committee, Mr. Schlickman's committee, works with the superintendent on identifying um, uh, standards indicators and elements of the evaluation. So that's, that's, a, that's which district goals will be the practice goal and the student achievement goal. There's a template that we created over the past couple of years. <clears throat> Uh, then there's budget adoption. Um, the policy reads that we're supposed to um, approve the budget after presentation to town uh, bodies, so that may, ha that may be something that Lens Committee has to revise. Um, there's a report on minority hiring. There's the approval of the school calendar. Curriculum adoption, which doesn't have a date, but that's usually when the uh, principal comes to us and, approve and presents the uh, program of studies or revisions to it. Second meeting in October assignment of students to schools, and then uh, the school choice vote by June 1st. So those are the policies that I found. Mm -hmm. So if the Policies and Procedures Subcommittee or anybody else goes through this and finds some policies that I didn't catch, just, just send an email to Karen and we'll just add to this mm -hmm. and make it a kind of a document that future chairs can use as a reference. Thank you for doing the, this. Um, the calendar is what something that Jennifer had put together, and I just sort of, you know, tried to drop in, you know, different dates based on policies. So if if people <clears throat> think something's missing, or want to change something, or want to add something, just just uh, let me know. So any discussion on the calendar? It's very much a draft, and it's a work in progress, and it's always going to be a live, uh, living document. Yeah. Yeah. So one thing that we should have added um, to either one of the September dates is a review of the capital um, uh, submissions, what was requested okay. for capital planning. Mm -hmm. We okay. had talked about that they go in and that we were going to review them. Um, first or the second first, meeting. In first or second meeting. Yep. Okay. Great point. You had something else? The only other thing is, is that I'm looking at May as being a potential uh, retreat um, <clears throat> in, in that uh, this is also town meeting season and it's probably an exhausting and time consuming time I know. starting the last week in April that if we do it in May we should be doing it towards the end of May just so we're not doing it on a week we're out a couple of nights of town meeting and here a night and, and doing the other things uh, that, that we need to do to get through that probably yeah. our busiest time of the year yeah yeah fair enough that's coming up, so I, I was going to kind of pull people. Anything else on the calendar? MASC Day on the Hill is April 25th. I just, you know, we, we've had that on the agenda in the past. I look at last year's agenda. People, anyone attending? I just want to share the, the, I don't know what's going on at the State House, but with the people are meeting the at the street. Masonic Temple, yeah. and I spoke to Margaret Thomas when they had Medco on the Hill. She said, worked out, they started somewhere else, and then when they got up to the, the State House, they got lost because they were rerouted in some of the hallways. So, if you're going to meet, find the path of the day to get to the, the people. I'm not I'm going to be able to make it. I'm not going to be able to make it either. I don't know if anyone's able to make it this year. Okay. And then <clears throat> the retreat. So, uh, I, did we have a retreat last year when we talked about goals? I don't remember. We had it. We had the. So I don't. I don't want to force. I don't want to force a retreat. But um, just for, cl yeah. for clarification, we're talking district goals, are we talking superintendent's goals, or are we talking both? Both. Thank you. I thought it would, I mean. I think we need it, uh, but I also agree with Mr. Schlickman. It's a very tight time of the year. I don't I'll put out a doodle and see what's available. What's available. Okay. All right. Any questions on anything? Um, Whoa. Oh. <laughs> Excuse me. Yes. So when and how are you going to slot in which goals are going to be um, reported on. You know, I, I know you've got the placeholders for reporting yeah. on goal number whatever, things like that. So, um, <clears throat> my thinking was that once 
we approve the goals for the year, then I would um, come back, I would work with Dr. Bodhi, come back to the committee and slot in the different goals, okay. and then we would discuss it. Okay. At the retreat or? We would either discuss it at a meeting or at the retreat, okay. yeah. So, okay. but I mean, you know, the way, just so, just so we're clear on the goals, the way that, the way that the, 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 everything works in terms of the, the policy, which we've had a lot of different discussions on, there's different perspectives on it, but this is the policy, is <clears throat> Dr. Bodhi um, presents her goals by the 15th. So the meeting on the 11th, I'm sorry, the district goals, she presents the district goals on the um, 11th, which could mean a preliminary discussion on the 27th if she's ready. If not, we just get them by policy on the 11th. And then we have a first reading on the 25th and then uh, an approval of those goals on June 8th. Once the goals are approved at the same time, we've got a, um, at that meeting, Paul's committee has to come to us with a recommendation on the, uh, what we're gonna measure Dr. Bodie by, mm -hmm. according to the policy. And correct me if I'm wrong, I'm asking the, the board, we were talking about revamping or replacing the tool to meet the needs for the, for the upcoming <coughs> one. So I guess that we put that back to his committee as well? Yeah. Okay. But I mean, <clears throat> you know, here we are. It's, it's, I know. That's what we're so I'm not sure what we can do. Okay, yeah, I mean, yeah, certainly Paul's committee. Well, it's actually a policy. Yeah. Um, it's right. actually a policy. Okay. The, the, yeah, the Close evaluation the forms a policy. The goal is curriculum. Yeah, so I mean, if, if, if Mr. Cardin's committee um, wanted to take a look at that, you can. But I mean, there, you know, there's, there's a limited amount of time here. And, you know, and we've been through this long discussion. <laughs> Every year. About the timing of this and, uh, you know, the policy is the policy. Okay. So, so I'm going to just sort of keep this as, as, a, as a guide and uh, <clears throat> maybe refer to it every meeting just as a gentle reminder that this is what we've got coming up. Mm -hmm. good. Okay, so we may not, and if we can't get a retreat in, then we're just going to have to talk about the goals in the regular meeting, yep. and that's all there is to it. All right. I'm impressed. Any questions? Okay. <laughs> Consent agenda is 810. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence approval warrant. It's, uh, 17158 total warrant amount 456,074.25 dated 3 Approval of minutes of the regular school committee meeting on March 30th, 2017. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Subcommittee reports. You guys are just appointed, so no one's got a report, I don't think. Nope. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I made a re just to tell the board, I made a request to the new policy chair for uh, to set up a meeting because I have a couple of things that I'd like presented and just wanted to share that with everybody. Good idea. Um, any uh, announcements in future agenda items? Uh, not, I just, uh, back the Warren Committee, everyone got paid. I just want to, yep. that's still active. We had, we had talked about, or I had suggested having uh, Ruthie Bennett present her maintenance approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's not on your schedule. It could mean yep. fall, if it doesn't, we don't have time for it this spring, but. Uh, a maintenance uh, approach, okay. Yeah, she did a presentation to the Board of Selectmen. Similar, similar. Just what she did at the yep. BOS. Yep. You want that line in the spring or the fall? Whenever. All right, well, I'll work with Kathy and see if we can get it. All right, okay, thank you. Yep. Under liaison, real quick, uh, EDCO, the last meeting of the year of school committee was uh, last week, and uh, the uh, Kissy and I attended. We represent probably half the uh, school committee members that have showed up the last couple of meetings. We discussed what's going forward, uh, what we're going to be talking about next year. Uh, Stratton PTO board met uh, for a meeting last year end of the year discussion of events and uh, what they plan on doing for next year. Audison Parent Group OPAC met uh, last Friday. There was a presentation. I'd like to commend the guidance people to the superintendent. They did an excellent job and did a Q&A with the parents. And under announcements, if I may. Yeah, go ahead. Patriot State Parade will be held on Sunday, April 23rd, unlike a lot of other towns. Um, it will run down Massachusetts Avenue from Brattle Street to Adams Street. <laughs> okay. Anything else? So if you're going to march, let uh, Karen know. 
okay, so just she needs to kind of report who's going to march. Mr. Mm -hmm. Schleckman's going to march. Great. Jennifer, that's all I have so far. Jennifer, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. To, uh, with respect to um, Ruthie Bennett, I've already talked to her about this, and she is going to look at the calendar and see which Thursday she could do it. Great. All right, folks, um, <clears throat> so we move into executive session, and as I understand it, we're gonna come back out and make a vote in public session, mm -hmm. so we gotta let the camera people know that. So motion to move into executive session to conduct strategy <clears throat> sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union in, in which, if held in an open session, may have a detrimental effect to conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which if held an open session may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be conducted. Approval of Chief Financial Officer John Danisio's contract. Approval of draft uh, executive session minutes of March 30th, 2017. Do I have a motion? So, so move. move. I have a second. Second. So motion by Dr. Uh, Allison Ampey, second by Dr. Starks. Um, <laughs> oh, the woman in doctors. Like, why not? Why not? Go for it. Sure. You have a terminal degree, right? You have a, yeah, terminal. Uh, yeah, terminal. Degree. terminal. Uh, so we have to take a not terminal. I didn't mean it that way. I, yes. Wait. Ms. Starks. Yes. 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 The motion carries unanimously, six zero. We are now in executive session. Thank you. We are returning from executive session, and uh, one of the things we have to do in this meeting is approve the contract of our new chief financial officer. John Denisio. John Denisio. Yeah, thank you. I drew a blank on his name. Signing the motion, Mr. Slickman. Uh, motion to approve the contract and authorize the chair to sign. Second by Mr. Hayner. Any discussion on the contract with our new chief financial officer? The contract uh, goes into effect on July 1, his first day of work with us. He's still working for the district. Yeah. So, any questions? Great. We're going to take a roll call vote by policy. Mr. Carter? Yes. Ms. Starks? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hayner? Yes. Yes. And Jeff votes yes. Okay, so it's a unanimous 6 0 vote. We have a new chief financial officer uh, once he signs the agreement. And he has. He has. Oh, he has. So we well, all you got to do is sign it. We got we, a deal. We got a deal. We have a new chief financial officer starting on July the 1st. You ready for this? Motion to adjourn. Adjourn. So move. Second. Any discussion? There is none on that motion. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, it passes unanimously. Thank you very much, everybody. Aye.